Awesome. And we're really going to have to work on that. We're going to have to start doing calisthenics. We're going to start warming up with some stretches and some jumping jacks and kind of get everybody going in the morning. Well, it's good to see everybody this morning. We just wrapped up a series called The DNA of Joy, where we uh, kind of took an overview of Philippians. Um, I think uh, a lot of people, um, including myself, really got a lot from that. I think it came at a really good time for, for a lot of us. And that's kind of what God does, doesn't he? He kind of sees the big picture. He kind of knows what we need to hear. If we're, we know how to listen and we're willing to listen. Well, before that, we'd started going on a journey through Acts. And I really love the book of Acts. Does anybody, when you think about movies, you hear this said a lot. The sequel is never better than the original, or it's hardly ever better than the, than the original. So... What movie are you thinking about right now? Now you're in church, make sure you don't mention that you like a rated R movie or anything like that. Star Wars. Star Wars. Now, that's the exception to the rule because everybody who knows anything knows that The Empire Strikes Back, which was the sequel to A New Hope or the first Star Wars is what it was called then, was better. Right? But you had to. Hey, that's right on point. I was going to talk about Star Wars anyway, believe it or not. <laughs> but if you, if you just watch Empire Strikes Back, it's hard to know what's going on if you haven't seen the first one, right? So the sequel, you really can't understand it unless you understand the first one. But then the sequel also help you understand some things about the first one that you didn't know before. But a lot of times that's not the case. Um, I don't know, can anybody think of one that you're really looking forward to the second movie after the first one came out and it just, it just wasn't very good? Any spe specific one come to mind? Lake Placid? Shrek, Shrek 2 wasn't nearly as good as Shrek 1. <laughs> Sometimes we're really disappointed. Well, the reason I say that is because the book of Acts is the sequel to Luke. Does anybody know that? Really, you know, Luke wrote those all as one act. If you look at the, the very beginning of Luke and the very beginning of, of Acts, the introductions are the same. They're both written to Theophilus, which more than likely was a, a noble, uh, somebody of nobility, um, but Theophilus also means friend of God or lover of God. So, you know, it was written to us too. Or it was written for us too. It was written to Theophilus, but it was written for the church. And God's really cool like that. So I want to take us back and talk about a little bit of a few of the things we talked about, I don't know, months ago when we introduced Acts. Just some things to keep in mind when you read Acts and when we talk about Acts, when God speaks to us through Acts. Um, number one, it's the sequel to Luke, but number two, it's the Holy Spirit's book. You know, Jesus was the star, Jesus is always the star of the show. The whole scripture as a whole is centered around Christ. But on Christ's mission, right, all leading up to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the whole gospel of Luke is an orderly account of those events. And it's got a lot of Jesus' teachings, teachings recorded in it. But then at the end of Luke, in the beginning of Acts, Jesus goes away and sends the helper, the comforter, sends the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God that was also present throughout the entire collection of books we call the Bible. But this is really where we really learn about the Holy Spirit, where he really gets in and really gets busy uh, working on and forming this thing that we call the church. Now, we have this bad habit of, did anybody do this when you were little? He said, here's the church. Can anybody do it? I'll probably mess it. Here's the church. All right? Here's the steeple. Open it up and see all the people. I can't even do it anymore. I don't think anybody's really getting it right. And here's all the people, all right? So that's not how, that, is that, but that's, it's cute, but it's so wrong. Because this thing isn't the church. Right? The thing you open it up and see is the church. Right, The people are the church. The community is the church. Another thing we, we need to think about when we read Acts, and this is why I really like to go through Acts, and I think it's really important for a church to go through Acts, is because when Jesus was walking around, he did miracles. He performed signs and wonders. There was a lot of really awesome stuff going on. We talked about right, the loaves and the fish that fed the multitudes last week. We talk, we, we talk about people's children being raised from the dead, people being miraculously healed, 
people freed from demon possession and all sorts of things. But then Jesus dies, he's buried, he's resurrected, he ascends into heaven and sends the Holy Spirit, and then the people of the church are going about, and God is beginning to work signs and wonders through them, which have continued to this day. Now, some people claim that all that stuff ceased and it stopped, but I just want to know when. Right? It's a continuation, right? That was, that was when it got started, and we're part of, we're part of the momentum of what was started there. Uh, Miss Becky was telling me about uh, a church in Birmingham who launched, was it 15 campuses? I think she's not in here, so I don't have her to confirm this information. But I think in one day, they launched 15 new churches in one day. Right. Paul traveled 10,000 miles in over about 27 years. Now, he didn't have the technology and the tools that we're working with now, but he, he planted probably approximately 14 churches the Apostle Paul. And we just had 15 show up in one day in Alabama. So God is still at work, folks. He's still at work. But it's about how God can for, uh, form this community of believers, right, powered by the Holy Spirit to spread the gospel throughout all the world. What was the great commandment? To go into all the world making disciples and to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But why do people see this as a threat? You see, before Paul was converted, and I don't know if you remember back, but the last thing we talked about before we jumped into the Joy series was the conversion of Paul. Paul was breathing threats against the church. He was intimidating the church. He was standing by and watching people being persecuted. But why was it a threat then, and why is it a threat now? Well, I can give you some reasons. Number one is people believe it's true. People believe it's true. Right? The reason Hitler was a threat because everybody believed that the things he was telling them were true, that the Jewish people were a threat and that they needed to be cleansed and that sort of thing. It's a, th it's a threat when people believe that it's true. We believe it's true for us, don't we? Right? You'll have that conversation a lot. It's like, well, I know you believe you know, that, that this is true. And maybe it's true for you, but it's not true for me. Well, how in the world does that happen? Right? Is my shirt just black for me? I might be colorblind. Somebody might be going, oh, that's navy. But yeah, I can't tell. You can ask Jan. I get in trouble for not being able to recognize navy blue. But, right, it's true for us. But here's, here's, where, we, here's where we really get in trouble. We believe it's true for everybody else, too. And that's where people really don't like it. That's when people really don't like it, even though the people who believe in Islam, who, people who believe in all the, the uh, Hindu gods, people who don't believe God exists at all, also believe that's true for me. Right? But for some reason, for some reason, it's, tr it's not right for us to believe that that's true for everyone. And here's the last part. We're allowing God to use us. Part of Christianity, part of the Great Commission is God is using us to go convert people to Christianity. So not only do we believe that it's true for us, we believe it's true for everyone, we also believe that it's true that God has put us on a mission to go change other people's minds about it. Right? To throw our religion in their face, which is not what God sent us out to do necessarily. But he sent us out to preach the gospel. He sent us out to make disciples. He sent us out as vessels to help transform people's minds and hearts when it comes to the gospel and believing that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. That's going to ruffle some feathers. But it didn't just start in the last 20 to 30 years. It was ruffling feathers right from the very get-go, wasn't it? Right? People were being put in jail. They were being stoned to death. They were being tortured, beheaded, you name it, all for the name of the gospel. So it's nothing new that we deal with. As a matter of fact, we've got it pretty easy on the persecution part of it. So easy, sometimes I think we get really, really complacent. Here's another really amazing thing that really starts to show its face here in Acts chapter 9. And, and I mean, it really does from the very beginning, but I really want us to notice what's going on here. And I want to ask you, do you believe that God still communicates with his people? Do you believe that God speaks to you? Now, you tell the wrong people that, and you're going to be in a straitjacket. 
and on medication, right? Because they're afraid of what God might tell you to do. They're afraid God might tell you to go Old Testament again and start stoning your children and, doing, and killing people who have broken God's law, right? That's what they're afraid of. Even though they're not seeing examples of that anywhere in the Christian church, anywhere in the world any, that we know of, right? It's not happening. It's like, so if that's what we're supposed to be doing, if you think that's what our scriptures are commanding us to do, how come you never see that? But God still communicates with his people. As a matter of fact, if God has never spoken to you, maybe you didn't recognize that's what it was, or maybe you don't think about it that way, but if you haven't been spoken to by God, you're not a Christian. You're not born again. Listen to this. John verse 10 1 through 5. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens. The sheep, what do they do? Hear his voice. And he calls his sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. They know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee for him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Right? So if you have not entered the door, you have not heard, entered the door if you have not heard the voice of the shepherd. Our God is a talker. Matter of fact, that's one of the key things that makes him unique from all the other gods in the world, is that God directly communicates with you and me in many different ways. Right? Even in Islam, which is which is similar, right, as far as having one God. They believe that we all worship the same God, and then it would split with Ishmael and Isaac. But they don't believe that you can have any. God is too high and mighty and holy, which he is, honestly, right? They're right about that. But they don't believe that he talks to you. And even in the afterlife, you never get to be in the presence of God. You never communicate with God. He only communicated with select people at times in history. Um, And even then, even then they didn't really hear him. So God communicates with us, and we're getting ready to see this in Acts chapter 9. He communicates with his people in many, many, many different ways. All right? The number one way, he, or not the number one, but the first one I'm going to talk about is through his creation. Romans 1 verse 20 says this, uh, For since cre- the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, for they are without excuse. Through his creation, his internal attributes are clearly seen. So at the very basic level, if you break down the human body to the very basic level, we all know this, what? We are lines and lines and lines of information called DNA. We are written and designed with information. Right. And just on top of that, if you're more of the inspirational, like the spiritual, where you just, just go out and, and look at a sunset and a mountaintop and you think, Who could have imagined this? Who could have made this? God will speak to us through our creation. There are people in our church that you can talk to that we're going through a tough time and God has sent part of his creation or given them a sunset. Uh, Haley asked for, what, rainbows three days in a row when she was young. Kind of, I guess, checking to see if God was still listening. And she got three in a row, and then on the third day she got a double rainbow. I know Miss Vicky has had a deer show up at very important times in our life. So God will use his creation to speak to his people. Now, I don't have a really good example of that in our passage we're going to go through this morning, but the rest of them I believe I do, or most of them. God, number two, God talks to us through the scriptures. We all believe that. Most of us believe that, right? That the scripture is the written word of God, and it was written to different people, but it was written for us. And how many times have you gone through, if you're an avid Bible reader, you've gone over the same passage probably a hundred times in your life, but then you're in a certain situation or circumstance and you notice something you never noticed before. It's almost like somebody stole your Bible, right, ripped that page out, printed a new one, and added some words in there because there's no way. I've read this book a million times, but somehow God has put something else in here for me. It's known as the living word of God, or it's known as the written word of God because Jesus is the word of God. And the Bible is God's written word. Now this one you might doubt, but he also speaks to us through gifted teachers. It's weird to say that. It's like I'm standing up here popping my collar saying, yeah, gifted teacher. 
But I believe God, I do believe that. I'm confident that God has given me the gift to stand up here and do what I do, or he wouldn't allow me to be here. And there are a lot of other teachers and gifted teachers in this room. Uh, That doesn't mean necessarily that you stand up and deliver a sermon, but teaching is just teaching something to someone else, like helping them uh, learn how to do something or or, or helping them learn information, Uh, teaching them about the ways of God, teaching them uh, Scripture, helping them understand Scripture. Now, here's the one I think is the most important for us. One of the most important for us this morning is he speaks to you through your faith family. Anybody ever witnessed that or ever, anybody testify of being a part of that or having that happen to you? I mean, how many times? How many times have you been thinking about something, dealing with something? You know, you don't want to go to church because something's going on. You walk through the door, and the first person you talk to is going through the same thing you're going through. Or the first thing somebody says to you answers a question that you had. Right? Or you think I'm talking directly at you. And if you think I'm talking directly at you, Mike, it's because I am talking directly at you. I wrote this sermon with you in my... No, I'm just kidding. But right, you think, well, there's no way. How, this guy doesn't even know me. How in the world are you talking about this when this was the thing I've been worried about for, for weeks? This is the thing I didn't even want to come to church about. Now, you know, you're using that. You're using the teachers. You're using the faith family. You're using the worship music uh, that we're singing together. Right? And you're speaking to me. All right, now here's where it gets really fun. Right? Here's where it gets to, here's, this is some of the things like you, you don't know if you should bring it up. You don't know if you're, like, you're in that kind of church that talks about this stuff or not. But dreams and visions. I believe dreams and visions are very alive and well within the church today. Right? Does anybody ever had a dream or even a vision that you believe and you know that was directly from God? That told you something about yourself or, or maybe forewarned you about something that was getting ready to happen? I mean, just... A couple of weeks ago, I had a dream that my grandfather fell at his house, and I was there. And when my mom came to visit, she told the, one of the first things she told me was about how he had fallen this week. And then I wonder, was I supposed to do something, you know? Or was this just God let me know that, hey, man, you, I really need to pray for them. I really need to go in deep and pray for them this week. What about angels? Anybody ever had a visit from an angel or think that you have? All right. Even in Hebrews, it talks about to be kind to everyone because you never know when you might be entertaining an angel. God has used angels, and the word angel means messenger, to deliver messages, and I believe he still does to this day. Um, you know, I mean, I've, I've heard, I've talked to some people that believe with, beyond the shadow of a doubt that they've, uh, they've met angels, but I believe that those stories are better uh, from a first-person witness. Uh, but I do 100% believe that God still does that. But primarily, and I think the main method of communication along with Scripture is just impressions of the Holy Spirit. Because you remember before or after you believed, that voice is like you're getting ready to do something really dumb, and I've got a lot of these experiences, but there's a voice in there that you're not thinking it on purpose, but they're saying, hey, don't do that. You know? It's like that voice that's telling me, telling me while I'm up here with my computer, hey, don't play Angry Birds. Right? The sound might be on, and, you'll get, and they'll know. Right? You've got those impressions of the Holy Spirit. God, you feel like God really wants you to do something or really doesn't want you to do something. You, know? you felt like something was wrong even before you read it in the Ten Commandments because God has written those laws in your heart, and God speaks to you through the Holy Spirit. Have you ever had a situation where somebody said, Hey, I just feel like God wanted me to tell you blank. And you're like, Oh, boy. Wow. There, and you know there is no, and you'll try to rationalize it out and figure out how they knew, but you know there is no way that they knew what to say to you. Or they could have known what they were talking about. So let's go back over these. Creation, through the scriptures, through gifted teachers, through your faith family, through dreams and visions, through angels, and by impressions of the Holy Spirit, which is God talking directly to your mind, God talk, talking directly to your spirit and your heart. I think everybody in here has experienced probably more than one of those. So let's look at Acts chapter 9, and let's think about this as we go through Acts chapter 9. Let's think about what's going on with Paul, or at this point he's still Saul. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from the synagogues of Damascus, so that if you found anyone who were of the way 
which means if we found any Christians, right? Because before we got the name Christian, uh, it, w- it was just known as the way. If you were a follower of Jesus, you were a part of this thing called the way. Coming from I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. But whether men or women, that he might bring them bound, they might capture them, and bring them to Jerusalem. And as he, ju- as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So he saw a light and heard a voice. He saw a light. It says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I love this response. And he said, who are you, Lord? Like he asked him who he was and then said who he was. You know? It's like if Jan came up here and knocked me down and I just said, who are you, Jan? Okay? I always love that response. And maybe it means something else, but I've just always taken it that way, so I'm running with it. Uh, and then the Lord said, I'm Jesus who you're persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, like I can imagine we would all be, he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Anybody ever made that statement to God? What do you want me to do? And then he tells you, and you're like, well, what do you want me to do except for that? I, I surrender some, but I, I don't know if I can do that. But he says, what do you want me to do? And thankfully for us, Paul listens. The Lord said to him, arise and go to the city, and you'll be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, seeing no one. Hearing a voice, seeing no one. And if we're really honest, if someone told us they heard a voice, but they didn't see anyone, and they were listening to the voice, what do we, come on, let's be honest, what do we, what's the first thing we think? Oh, it was God. It was Jesus. It was the Holy Spirit. Nope. We think, whoo Right? Just, just being honest. It takes me a second, even still sometimes, even though I've seen it time after time, I believe 100% that God speaks to people, but when they say it, I still, I still question it sometimes. Because I want to wait and hear what they said. I want to hear if it lines up. It's like, you know, if God told you to, to uh, go, you know, base jumping or, you know, be an Oklahoma fan or something like that, there's no way God said that. Right? If it doesn't line up with Scripture, now I do want to say this, because there are competing voices, right? The Scripture in John says we don't know the voice of strangers, and no doesn't mean we don't know of it. It's, that's not simply what no in the Bible means. When you see no, it's a really, it can mean a really, really intimate, close relationship, a really close knowledge, right? When it talks about consummating a marriage, the Bible will refer to that as to know someone. <clears throat> but that being said, so we... <laughs> I was kind of started looking around after a... Anyway, okay, this is... Lord, help me. All right, so he heard a voice, and he saw no one. They led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus, and he was three days without sight, and he neither ate nor drank. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus, a disciple, another believer, named Ananias, and said to him, the Lord said in what? A vision. Ananias. And I, Ananias said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying, and in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hands on him so he might receive his sight. Now, sometimes we get put in situations where we have God will close the door and we'll wind up going down one path. We may not know why we got a certain, didn't get a certain job or we're stuck in a certain job or, or why that the, the traffic was closed somewhere or why God may want me to go here and do this or why he put me in this church. But what we don't think of is the other person. Right? We have Paul here and we have Ananias that are being both spoken to by Jesus and he's got them on a collision course. You've probably got relationships in your life that you know were divine appointments that you look back on and think, man, God was fashioning this in his life and fashioning this in my life so we would come on this collision course and have this conversation and have this divine appointment. So he said, here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street. Oh, I already read all that. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests and to bind all who call on your name. Man, 
Isn't that how we are? Like God is speaking to him directly. He's saying, hey, this guy. And we're like, nah. No, no, God. He, he's, he's, no, he's scary. He's dangerous. And he even has permission from the church to hurt me. Um, I know you said go, but I'm not going to go. Because let me tell you, God, let me give you the information that you need. <clears throat> but the Lord said to him, go, for he's a chosen vessel of mine, a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. So it's almost like God is saying, well, I know you don't want to go talk to Paul, but he's going to have to go through a lot more than you. And Ananias obeyed. He went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, now what's going on here? Why do you think I have this underline? His faith family. God is using the faith family. He's already used visions. He's already used impressions of the Holy Spirit. You know, when the light showed up and he heard Jesus' voice, right, we believe the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. He had an, a huge impression of the Holy Spirit. Right? There, was, there were visions. They each had visions. And now he's using the faith family. But he laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and received his sight at once, and he, rose and he arose and was baptized. Has anybody ever said anything to you when you've come to church that helped you understand something, that opened your eyes to something in your life or opened your eyes to something in the Scriptures? So when he had received food, he was strengthened, and Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus, and then immediately he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he was the son of God. So what did Paul begin to do? God had given him a gift to teach and to preach, and he started using that gift to allow him to be a vessel to, for God to speak to people through. Isn't that awesome? Doesn't that still go on today? So if all that goes on, you know, God is a talker. It hasn't changed since then we got to grab a hold of that as a church, not only here. I know we do it to some degree, right? But, man, we got to be passionate about letting people know that there's a God that loves you, that is present with you, that will speak to you, guide you, direct you. And when he speaks, he speaks to be obeyed. He speaks out of love for you, but he speaks to be obeyed. So if you're sitting in the room and you're thinking, I'm going to stop right there at verse 20, Cody. I'm so sorry. Please forgive. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. It's a big part of what we do here. Anytime you call somebody by their brother's name, you've got to make sure they forgive you. But you might be sitting here thinking, okay, you've said some scary stuff. You've said that I am not going to heaven, that I'm not a Christian, that I'm not born again if I've never heard the voice of God. Now, I believe that most of you, I believe that all of you have at some point. You might not have answered the call, but I believe everybody's sitting in here because they've heard from him. But maybe you, you're, there's something wrong with the antenna. Because there's always a signal coming out. There's always a signal coming out, but we're, we're not always receiving it. I'm raising my hand. as I, I am, I'm testifying. I'm confessing that I, my receiver, my receptor, or whatever you call that thing, is not always functioning the way it should be. But you might be asking yourself, I know, I believe you. I believe that people have told me they've heard from God. I believe they're telling me the truth. But how come I don't hear? Okay? And right now, if you're someone that doesn't think that you've heard from God or that you hear God, you're the most important person in the room. Number one, you don't expect to. You offer up a prayer, you read the scriptures, you come to church, but whether it's because you don't believe it or what, you just don't expect to. So just be honest this morning, did it cross your mind? How many people in here did it cross your mind this morning before you came, it's like, I'm getting up, I'm going to go to church, and I'm going to hear from God. I wasn't, right? I was thinking, hey, I'm going to go to church, I'm going to help set up the curtains, I've got to make sure i got my scriptures in, i got to, you know, um, I'm late again, I hope they're not mad at me. But I didn't come expecting to hear from God. I believed I would, but I didn't come expecting it. I, I, didn't, I don't start thinking about it until I start having conversations, and people start preaching my sermon to me. Like, how in the world did you... 
you're, you're stealing my thunder. I was going to say all that stuff. It's not going to be a surprise. Number two might be you just weren't taught to. I wasn't. You know, I was taught what to do, what not to do, how to dress, how not to dress, what songs to sing, what to pray, what not to pray, who I should fellowship with, who I shouldn't fellowship with, who my friends should be, who they shouldn't be. But I wasn't taught that God talked to me. You know, the Holy Spirit was just the dude that wrote the Bible. And, and maybe it was taught and I didn't pick up on it, but maybe you just weren't taught that God will talk to you. Maybe it was just too weird or, or, or too much of a chance or, or the the place that you grew up learning about the Holy Spirit didn't believe that God actively speaks to people, which, which breaks my heart. Now, here's the one that's true for me too much. You don't want to. You don't want to because <laughs> you're afraid of what, might, what he might say, what he might want you to do, what he might want you to give up. And most of the time you know. A lot of times, he may just be waiting for you to do the last thing he asks you to do before he gives you a new direction or before he opens a new door. And I think the last reason is just we're just not intentional. I mean, do, how many of us set aside time? You know, Jesus would go isolate himself for hours and hours and hours on end. That we, we give up a prayer to God, we've been asking God about something. But you know how conversations generally work with us people? Right? We get into a conversation, we say what we want to say, and then we sit there and we wait for the other person to get through making noise so we can have our turn to talk again. Right? He, yeah, I know, I'm guilty. We're, we've all been guilty of that. But we don't intentionally set ourselves up to hear. How much of your time, how much of our lives are quiet anymore? And sometimes we can't even stand the quiet because maybe we're afraid of what God might say. So we don't expect to, we weren't taught to, we don't want to, or we're just not intentional. But I'm so glad we did hear from God. I'm so glad we're here this morning. I'm so glad we have the opportunity to go to heaven through Jesus Christ. So let me give these to you one more time in case you're someone who likes to write things down and you haven't. God will speak to you through his creation. He will speak to you through his scripture. He will speak to you through gifted teachers. He will speak to you through other believers or your faith family. He will speak to you through dreams and visions. He'll speak to you with angels, and he'll speak to you by impressions of the Holy Spirit. Now, not everybody in here will experience every single one of those, but more than one. And you know why God will speak to you? Because our God's a talker. He's a communicator, and he loves you. If I told you that I love my wife and my kids, and they came to you and said, yeah, he never talks to us ever, what would you think? Yeah. I think you're saying that because you think you're supposed to, but I don't think he loves you if he never speaks to you. If I don't speak to him for two or three years, so your God loves you, your God is, speaks to you, he's speaking to you right now, and he's speaking to you in one of these ways. So let's listen to God this week. Let's come back before we get rolling or after the service next week, and let's talk about how God spoke to us. And I promise you we won't have you committed. We'll just celebrate. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you so much that you're a great God, a holy God, an all-knowing God, a perfect God, a loving God. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your church, your creation. I thank you for my family. I thank you for the scriptures. I thank you for everything that we enjoy in our country and in our community. God, I confess to you that we don't listen very well, that we sin against you and we don't do the things that you want us to do. And I just ask for your forgiveness and a renewed spirit. I ask that you would fill us and cover us with your spirit so we can go out and we can be vessels of your word, vessels of the gospel, vessels of good news, just like you designed us and instructed us to do. I thank you for putting your church together. Lord, I know we mess it up sometimes. We mess it up a lot even, and it can look ugly and not inviting to people. And I just ask you for you to forgive us uh, when we make a mess out of it. But Lord, also to give you praise and to be confident that there's beautiful things that we are doing through you. In Jesus' name I pray.